before administration of amniotis we should know the important prerequisites okay because see for example if patient is already having certain hemodynamic instability then apnea test will not be reliable and it can turn catastrophic for administration of apnea test before administration of apnea test we should know the important prerequisites okay because see for example if patient is already having certain hemodynamic instability then apnea test will not be reliable and it can turn catastrophic especially if the patient already has normal brainstem functions we are actually pushing him towards death right so what are those prerequisites first that patient should be in normal tension so some books mention a sbp of uh, more than 90 enough for example our api textbook mentioned that sbp of, sbp of more than 90 is enough uh, harrison and the other textbooks mention 100 in in simple words the patient should be in normal tension okay you can take your freedom to write 90 or 100 in your uh, written papers in exams the option would rather be specific i don't think they will say in one option sbp of more than 90 and another option of sb of sbp of more than 100 that is unlikely to appear as an option then we should make some ventilatory adjustments so that you have achieved a normal capnia because basically in apnea test we are trying to see whether hypercarbia stimulates respiratory center or not if hypercarbia is also not able to stimulate respiratory center that means the respiratory center is absolutely dysfunctional that is the essence of this test so to get the hypercarbia we should start with normal capnia right so we should have a psco of 35 to 45 mm of mercury other things are basic ventilatory settings like peep should be around 5 cm of water so once these prerequisites are met next is to start the process so how do we start the first step is we should pre oxygenate the patient basically we don't want hypoxia to trigger the respiration or we don't want the patient to start down spiraling because of hypoxia so we should pre oxygenate by giving 100% fio2 for around 10 minutes so that we end up achieving a pao2 of more than 200 mm of mercury this oxygenation is sufficient to sustain oxygenation for around next 8 to 10 minutes that is at the duration of this test right so once we achieve this we disconnect the ventilator we keep the et tube disconnect the ventilator and then we have to continue to oxygenate the patient for the entire duration of test so we have to give around 6 liter per minute of oxygen to the patient through a nasal cannula or an insufflation catheter inserted into the endotracheal tube reaching up to carina okay so we should be able to deliver oxygen almost at the level of carina so this tube should be positioned or the tip should be positioned at that level once you do that observe the patient for next 8 to 10 minutes again different textbooks mention different readings for this observation period some books i have seen i have seen precisely mentioning 8, 8 minutes some books precisely mentioning 10 minutes and then some authorities mentioning 8 to 10 minutes so keep this point in mind 8 to 10 minutes during this observation period of 8 to 10 minutes when patient is disconnected from the ventilator and he is being oxygenated through a cannula placed into his et tube observe for respiratory movement how do you observe respiratory movements or what defines a respiratory movements the definition for this purpose is basically abdominal or respiratory system excursions abdominal or thoracic excursions so if you notice that there are excursions of the abdomen or thorax that means there are respiratory movements if that does not happen for 8 to 10 minutes that means patient sustained apnea for that period okay then comes the question did we actually stimulate the respiratory center during this period and for that we need to see what is the psco2 at right? carbon dioxide level so to start with before even we begin pre oxygenation we should have got a, or before we disconnect the ventilator we should have got another one abg done here for a baseline psco2 and as defined earlier we should have this range to start with and once the test is completed we will repeat abg again and check the psco2 so if we have achieved a psco2 of more than 60 mm of mercury in a normal circumstances this is kind of enough to trigger the respiratory center that is there in the brain stem so that that is enough to initiate respiratory movements if the brain stem is not intact that means even at this PaCO2 level, the respiratory movements are not going to be triggered, right? So, if the PaCO2 of 60 is not achieved, that means your test is invalid. Okay, you have to 
redo the test at a later point of time. But if you have achieved that or if you have at least seen more than 20 millimeters of mercury rise over baseline, then the apnea test is valid and you can uh, rely on the result. So if patient was comatose, GCS3, he had all the brainstem reflexes absent and then the apnea test, even when the PCO to build up to 60 millimeters of mercury or 20 rise over the baseline and no respiratory movements were observed, then you can certify as brain death. But again, the law wants you to revisit the case at least at a minimum time gap of six hours and do a second assessment before you declare brain death. That is because again, there are, there are other confounding factors which influence apnea test or which influence our assessment of brainstem reflexes. So because of that, to avoid the error of uh, brainstem death, uh, like er erroneous certification of brainstem death, the authorities want us to do two tests. So this whole process should be repeated two times before you certify brain death by four doctors. And that is the, that is the essence of diagnosis of brainstem death. Then again here also you should also remember that apnea test can also be influenced by various parameters or factors and that also should be taken into account. Most importantly the drugs. There are various drugs which inhibit respiratory center in the brainstem. So those drugs should be ruled out before you initiate the apnea test. And if you already know that the patient is on these drugs, then comes an important thing is that you should know their half-life. You should give sufficient time for those drugs to be cleared from the body before you do the apnea test. Okay. So that was simple about brainstem death. Now, before we wind up, let us take some MCQs and see if we have understood the topic well. So this was the essence of diagnosis of brainstem death. Are there any tests which confirms these clinical observations? Well, there are supportive tests or I can say ancillary tests, but there is no confirmatory test.